So you may have heard of a program called Bash, but what is it? And why is it useful for you as a hacker? Well, as a hacker using Linux, you're going to be typing a lot of commands and you're going to be doing a lot of the same steps over and over again. Nmap scans, NICTO, WetWeb, DNS, all that stuff you can automate. Bash lets you write a bunch of commands that get run sequentially. You can also do lots of other cool things like if statements, while loops, and a bunch of other stuff that lets you branch out and change your program depending on what happens beforehand. And it's a good way to save you lots of time. And if you're doing bug bounties, time is money. Let's get started. So I have this Kali Linux virtual machine here. You should go ahead and get this beforehand. I have a video on that if you're interested. I went ahead and prepared a little folder here with a few versions of bash scripts. Each one is more complicated and solves a different problem than the last one. So just to show you how simple a bash script can get, I'm going to go ahead and open up a terminal here. Nano v1.sh. This is all a bash script really has to be. Now, programmers are probably going to be screaming at their monitors right now because everything is hard coded. If I wanted to change anything, if this script were super long, I would have to go through and change all of these numbers, all of these IP addresses. And they all go to the same one, but it's just super tedious and repetitive. And this would be very, very unusable. And you'd probably get fired if you ever wrote something like this in an actual job. But this basically just runs nmap, nmap, and then nicto just to get a lot of stuff on the system you were scanning. So let's try to run that a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Control X and hit Win to exit. And now I am just going to run that with period forward slash v1.sh. Going to run the nmap scan, finish the first one. So it's starting the second one now, and it's starting the third one. I forgot to mention I was also hosting a vulnerable web application on the IP address that it's scanning. So this is done on a local IP address. I cannot stress this enough. Do not do this stuff on machines that you don't own or have explicit written permission to test on. Nick Toe is looking for a bunch of stuff. And as you can see, it basically just ran a bunch of commands sequentially. And it put them all to the terminal. This is cool, but what if you want to change the IP easily? Well, this is our introduction into variables. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the second version of this file. And as you can see, what changed? We still have this part in the beginning. I forgot to mention this is the shebang. This is what tells your computer what program to run this with. So it's using bash. And you can see I have a new word, target. Target equals and the IP address that I'm going to scan. Now you can change target to whatever word you want. And these things right here have to match it. But the dollar sign is calling in a variable in place of this. So nmap dash sv. And then this is just referring to that here. Now I haven't set up variables for the ports here. Although it wouldn't be too difficult since you could just put the ports in. That's the only change we've made to the script so far. So I'm going to go ahead and hit exit and do escape without saving anything. V2.sh. We're going to see what happens. So it's going to run nmap again. This is basically going to output the exact same thing as before. By the way, all this stuff is from nmap detecting the juice shop, which is another vulnerable web application, but it's hosted on a port that it wouldn't normally be on, port 3000. It would normally be on port 80. As you can see, it output the exact same thing as before. Nothing changed except for making our lives easier as programmers. Now, what if you want to be able to supply your own IP addresses and ports from the command line? You know, something like this, being able to supply your own stuff, even in whatever order you want. These things right here are called options, and I'm going to teach you how to add single letter options in the next version of the script. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this, go back into Nano, and take a look at what we have here. Whoa, lots of things have changed. What exactly happened? Well, for first things first is I have comments now. This is also our first introduction into while loops. I'm not going to go over how while loops work because you can watch another video on that. But this is a built-in keyword that gets the options in these two flags, sets whatever the option is to this variable for each loop of the while loop, and does this. It will set the target to whatever we set as the T flag, you know, the dash T that we had earlier. That's what this is. This is option argument. And for the P flag, it will set whatever happened after that to the ports variable. And for anything else, we have an echo statement that prints something to the terminal that tells you how to use the flags with an exit code of one so that other programs know that this was an error. Close out the case statement and we're done with the while loop. Now we don't technically need any of this stuff, but all this means is that if there's no flags at all, but all this means is that if there are no flags at all, it'll tell you how to use them. Give you another example that prints to the terminal, a comment just for us, and it will set the variables to some default values. So this would still work. So let's try this out. We can try this with no variables or no options. We can see that it prints out exactly what we just highlighted. It gave us an example, and it's telling us what it's going to put in as a default. 
Other than that, it's just going to print the exact same output. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel this with Control C. But now we have the option to use whatever flags or options we want. So I'm going to go ahead and use the T for target flag. I'm going to go ahead and type in my attacker, or sorry, my victim box here, and I'm going to set the ports to be 80 and 3000. And as you can see, that's exactly what it's going to do. Anyway, this stuff is all cool, but it's just printing to the terminal. What if you actually want to save it to a file? Well, that's coming up next. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the next file here. So it looks like all this is the same and this new file, but we also have a little bit more down here. So we have the output file variable, which was set up here by the O flag, which is now a requirement. The O flag is going to be the path to your output file or the output file itself. And this is the option index, which gives us some leeway later by getting rid of all the flags and being stuck with just the arguments in case you want to pass this program off to something else afterward. Technically, we don't need it right now, but it would definitely make your life much easier. After setting the O flag to our file path or just the file name, if you want to set it to the same directory, after it's checked all of the flags to make sure everything's good, it'll go ahead and rewrite this output file to output file with, with some appended text that just says scan results.txt. It'll let us know that, and then everything else that you see here, except with a few changes. These take everything from here and output whatever came out here into the output file which we established here. And this makes sure that any errors also go in there as well. Otherwise, they would just end up in the terminal. So I'm going to go ahead and exit with Control X and N. But if we run this with v4.sh, we have a few options now. We have the O flag, which we can set to results for the T flag, which I'm setting to our target machine, and the P flag, which I'm setting to these ports right here. I'm going to hit Enter. And this is going to take a little while now, and we're not going to know what's happening because nothing's being printed to the terminal, and there's no loading bar or anything. So we're just going to have to wait until we see this pop up again. Okay, a short while later, it looks like it finished. Let's take a look. Results 4. And sure enough, everything's here. Now this is cool and all, but what if you actually want to filter this down and get only the important stuff? Let's take a look at the next version of the script. Everything here is the exact same except for what happens after this. All of this is the same except until we get to this point. So what does this do? All this does is instead of sending both the output text and the errors to the output file here, it just sends it straight to nothing, dev null. But the reason we get something in the output is because we get the filtered version of everything in the output here. So what does this mean? Well, grep lets you find text and lines based on filters that you set. So for this nmap command, the important bits here is that we're looking for version numbers, whether or not something's open or filtered, closed stuff we can't really do with, and then we just go ahead and send that to the output file. Pretty simple. This line gets rid of any line that starts with one of those stupid vertical bar thingies, because that's what nmap always likes to start their lines with. And we're going to pipe the output of this with this operator, which is another vertical bar, into another grep command that looks for any of the following lines with these words in them, and then it writes that to the output file. All of this is going to save you a ton of fluff. All the same stuff. But this grep command is interesting because it introduces the backslash. It's not literally going to look for a backslash here because backslashes are kind of special when it comes to programming. It tells the computer to interpret the character that comes next literally. So in this case, it's looking for the literal text being a plus sign and a space. And that's because Nikto reports its findings that have to do with these two things, which is your vulnerability database stuff with a plus and then a space. That way, this only returns things pertaining to vulnerabilities that you can exploit and also gets rid of a lot of fluff. So let's go ahead and run it. It's also going to tell us that it's doing this with some filters. And now we wait. All right, it looks like it's done. Let's take a look. This script is 200 lines. As you can see, only important stuff starts with a plus sign and the space like we talked about earlier. So this script is 200 lines long. Let's take a look at this one. How long is this? 267 lines. Over 150 additional lines that we've saved that didn't have anything meaningful. Hopefully now you guys can see the power of Bash and how you should absolutely learn it, or at the very least have somebody do it for you. And I promise you it will save you tons of time. It's not even funny. Hope you guys learned something and take care.